first of all, this, uh, for me, well, first of all, let me thank University of Nebraska and everybody attending, and Oklahoma State and Texas A&M. Russell, across, uh, are you going to stay here for the football game this Saturday, or are you going to go back to Texas? <laughs> I'll trade you tickets. <laughs> uh, this, for me, this is all about Carolyn. And uh, she'd be happy to see the crowd. And uh, a lot of you people knew her. <coughs> And she was an all-in kind of a gal. And uh, her advice would be, get on with this meeting, let's get it done, and then, then let's have some wine and a good steak. And all of you that know her know that <coughs> that'd be it. So we'll take off from there. And uh, uh, Mississippi's on there. We Again, this kind of gets back to Caroline. I, I couldn't uh, get comfortable on some of the other ranches we had after she drowned, and I just, uh, just said I just can't handle this. And, uh, and we've basically been relocating to, uh, uh, well, we're, we're out of Texas, almost. We're out of, uh, uh, we're out of Oklahoma out of California, which we really, we didn't necessarily love California, but we loved the ranch. Uh, and uh, and um, maybe out of Nebraska, not because I don't like it here, but I always will come back, but uh, we're just, we're trading land is what we're doing. And we think Mississippi is, gives us our best opportunity between the timber and the cattle. So we'll be, Next year, if I'm around, uh, uh, probably Mississippi will be the will be the only place. Come see us. It's a it, we've got a pretty nice place put together. Lots of houses, lots of lakes, 18 miles of river frontage, and uh, and lots of trees. And for anybody that don't know anything about the tree business, I'm going to tell you something. It's a piece of cake next to the cattle business. <laughs> and if I'd have known about the tree business 30 years ago, I'd probably <laughs> wouldn't be standing here right now. Uh, okay, let's see, uh, what's happened in the past decade plus three since the new millennium? This is my idea of the major events. The major events are the relentless beef cow liquidation, the relentless increase in land values, incredible drought, first in the South Plains, and then we, we, we shared this with you last year up here, didn't we? And, uh, and then uh, the final comment is that the cattle keep getting larger and larger, and either nutritionists are a lot better today than I was, or else the cattle were better. Probably a combination of both, I don't know, but performance is wonderful, cattle get bigger and bigger. And, but then who knows about efficiency, and I just throw that in there because the 82% calf crop, because that's what I've been told the average weaning calf crop is if you, from the start. Well, that's not very good. Uh, take a look at the beef cow numbers. I mean, it's, this is just nothing short of incredible, I think. If you go from 1950 to, the, to last year, to January 1, and from 2000 to now, the 10-year cycle, well, obviously the 20-year cycle, it wouldn't even be into effect. Uh, we, how few a cattle can we get along with? We don't know. We sure don't probably need as many as we had at one time. I'll tell you what we do know. We do know that 45 million cattle in 1975 was too damn many, and we don't ever want to go back there. And uh, for people that think we just have to get the beef cow herd back up, 
I think we, I'd just like to see it stop the, the decline, but I don't think the numbers need to be where they were at one time because of our improved efficiency and just the increase in the size of the cattle. And for those of you who had the unfortunate uh, experience of being in the cattle industry in 1974 and 1975 and in there, you know that 45 million cattle just damn near killed all of us. Uh, land prices, what a deal. And I finally broke it out between pasture and cropland for the last two years. And these, the trend is the, is the only thing that's important. And, and if you assume that if you're in the cattle business, you're in the land business and vice versa, well then these things go hand in hand. And my, I'll cover this right at the end, but my theory is that the last 10 years have been the most incredibly profitable time in the cow-calf business if you add to what's happened to your land values at the same time. And I, I personally, I don't think you can separate them. Now, some people are never going to sell the family ranch and all the rest. I, I obviously will sell anything when I need money, but uh, <laughs> which is fairly frequent. And, uh, and I love to do 1031s. Where's Annie? Annie, Annie, Annie. My, I wanted to introduce you to Annie Powell as my, uh, I've got a, a lot of good help and Annie Powell runs everything for me and she, I call her the queen of the 1031s and uh, we do a lot of 1031 exchanges and people say, well, how about the kids? How, how are they going to handle all this when you're gone? And I said, why will I care when I'm gone anyway? I just, and they've got a lot more to, aren't they lucky to have that to worry about? Well, whatever. But what, what an incredible change we've had here. Uh, just comparing the last 10 years, how many of you knew or would have thought that in 2001, the price of corn was $1.80 a bushel? And we all know it got to eight dollars a bushel, and then to seven. Obviously, when I put this together, it's out of date now. Uh, the uh, fat cattle price is about three dollars higher. The maybe the 550 weight hack calves are about fifteen or twenty dollars higher. The yearlings are sure fifteen dollars higher, and the, and the, again, the part of the beauty of the cattle business anymore is what you can cash in in terms of your packer cow values or your cow cow values. Uh, I had 80 cents there. We sold some at Norfolk, Nebraska last week and I think they brought 86 cents at the auction. And, uh, and uh, who knows where the corn price will be. As it was, if you're a user, is a, that was a good crop report that came out today. If you haven't seen it, it's uh, it, it, for the for the feeders, it's a it's a good one. I I'm just hoping the farmers hang on and think it's good enough for a while longer till I get this last farm sold up here, and then I'll be. <laughs> then I'll, I'll see. Anyway, uh, and by the way, I'm not bragging about any of this because the people that know me also know that that I've been poor. A relative, you're never poor if you're not poor in spirit, but uh, the, uh, how all this came about, whatever money I have, uh, uh, how, how this came about is, is from nothing but land and the cow business. Now, I shouldn't say nothing, but mainly. And so anybody that says the land business and the cow business hasn't been good for the 10 or 12, the last 10 or 12 years either. Either they're mistaking or, or Annie's not doing good on the, keeping track of my books. I'm not sure which, but, but I tell people that I don't, uh, I, I, well, I am a, a religious person, but I don't spend much time in church. And I said, so I don't tithe. And I said, this is, this is my tithing. And uh, I'm a Lutheran. Uh, like Garrison Keeler says, I'm a non-practicing Lutheran, so I don't have to go to church, but I can still feel guilty. And so uh, 
Anyway, so I'm getting rid of my guilt complexes on some of this. Okay, what's happened the last three years? More of the same. Uh, the feeder market awakened for a little bit, but uh, it continued uh, uh, land price increases, uh, uh, continued cow liquidation, and then, of course, the record drought. We put wheels under our cattle in Texas and Oklahoma and, and headed north. And uh, finally, the summer of 2010, and I think where I had the majority of my cattle, our total rainfall that year in that area in Texas was 1.4 inches. And uh, you know, there's I say there's three stages to a drought in terms of your mental attitude, and one is you know, it's it's going to rain pretty soon, and the next is it's got to rain sometime, and then the third is it ain't ever going to rain, and we've all been there. Uh, Kelton wrote the book, <coughs> the time when it never rained, and uh, which was in the 50s, and and people, many people believed by us it never was going to rain again. Anyway, th th we've had a lot of record prices all through this list uh, the last three or four years, but it hasn't, obviously hasn't guaranteed making any, or making people money. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the $1.32 fat cattle, which was just $1.32 for a heartbeat, you know, lost some people $100 a head. And, uh, you know, so, you know, who, who, who knows? Uh, bread cows, you know, there's sure been $2,000 bread cows sold and, and $2,000 heifers. Uh, uh, Ron Crocker, who's in the audience there, he, uh, his partner, I don't know, I think his partner keeps this part to himself, but they sold F1 heifers at uh, San Saba, what, three weeks ago, Ron? At, uh, well, you tell them. And they weighed 680 pounds, and they were open, guaranteed open by F1 heifers. So somebody is going to definitely get out there and pay too much again. And I, I think this will be, I think this will be the wreck for the cattle, the cow business this next time around, which might be 2014. Yeah, but we'll get that later. But please? pardon. You got to get some hearing aids, Dave. I want to borrow mine. <laughs> Seventeen hundred and eighty dollars for six hundred and seventy-five pound heifers. Open. Thank you. Yes, F ones. So, even even if you put that F one steer in, which is of much less value, even if you put him in at half price, it's still not a bad sale. Um, uh, Major industry events and the net, net results, uh, the massive cow liquidation in Texas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico, a million cows left, and so far they haven't been replaced. Maybe we stalled out the decline, but we sure as hell haven't replaced them. Smallest beef cow herd in over 50 years, continued excess feedlot capacity. Without a doubt, the stupidest deal we have did in the feedlot business in my lifetime, and there, that's a long time anymore, and we've done a lot of stupid things, but the wholesale expansion of the feedlot capacity in the late 1995s, 96, through 2001 or two, in face of what we all, what appeared to be a, 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 a d decline in cow numbers and turned out to be, that, that's, that's haunted us yet and it's going to haunt us for a long time to come. And 30% excess capacity might actually not, that might be a conservative estimate, I don't know. Uh, we've had record high prices for calves and yearlings of, what did Valentine, Nebraska had $2.45, four fifty weight calves last week. Is that not something? Uh, I think a huge deal, frankly, is the transfer of wealth from the former have-nots 
or to the former have-nots. And by that I mean the farmers and the landowners and the cowmen. And you can say anything you want to, but the cow business has historically been a break-even business except for the land. And all of a sudden it's changed in the last 10 years, and we all know what's happened to the farmers and that, how, they've, how they've been able to prosper the last several years. And, and uh, the different government programs may have kept them alive, but it didn't, again, it didn't necessarily give them much money to, to play with, and they, they have a lot of that now. Uh, the other thing that I think I'm even underestimating is the amount of cows that have moved to either confinement or semi-confinement. And uh, we've kind of used that as part of our program for the last 10 years, and the program is very simple. Buy cows out of a drought area, and if you brought them out of the drought area, you obviously probably don't find any, can't find any grass. So that means you either had to dry lot them or move them someplace else. Uh, short and long-term repercussions, the Texas State climatologist says we could have five to 10 more years of drought. Uh, that 12 month period in, beginning in September 2010, that 12 month period was the driest 12 months on record ever in, in Texas and New Mexico and probably in Oklahoma too. Uh, shortages of feed, obviously. Uh, tremendous, tremendous uh, cost to maintain your cow herd on a conventional setting if you happen to be in that middle of that drought and you didn't want to liquidate. I personally believe you can't feed your way out of the drought with, with hay. And people seem to think they can. I know people that in Texas that not including whatever little grazing they got and not including their labor or not including their land cost or anything else, spent $900 a pair to maintain a cow for that year right in there. And you say, how can that be? Well, first of all, cows will eat way more hay than you ever thought if you let them. And second, hay, poor quality hay can be way poorer than you ever thought it could be. And when that's costing you 250 to $300 a ton, you're gonna have a, somewhere between an 800 and a thousand dollar bill to feed that cow out on range. Uh, good news, uh, east of the 98th meridian, which would be like going up and down through um, uh, Grand Island and Wichita and, and so on and so forth, we have had a lot more rain this year. We're adding a lot more rain in certain areas west of there, but it's, it's uneven. And even with the additional rain, at least early this year, we had even faster cow liquidation. I, I think it's coming to a halt, and I wouldn't be surprised that we'll start rebuilding this next, next year. There's a lot of talk about rebuilding cow herd, or rebuilding the livestock industry in some areas, for example, in Texas with sheep, goats, hunting, and whatever. The big, 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 big problem, you just can't imagine how big it is, with sheep and goats is the predators will just drive you crazy. And between uh, the coyotes and the bobcats and the eagles and, and whatever else, it's, it's hard to stay in business like they did at one time in Texas. And uh, personally, I, I, even with, goat and sheep prices got incredibly high, got over $2 a hundred weight, I mean, over $2 a pound this, this several times this last, or this year. But I, I still don't think we'll see an increase in the goat and the, and the sheep population, even though much of that country, other than the predator, uh, except for the predators, would be better suited to something else. The deer deal, I'm not sure where that's going. Some people 
are getting along with it well. Some people are, it seems like it's seen its uh, heyday and maybe it's coming off a little bit, although I've got a neighbor who tells me that he turned down $750,000 for a breeding buck that I don't know what the Boone and Crockett would deal with dealing, but, but anyway, I said, well, are you going to ever sell them? He says, I'm asking a million and a quarter. I, I don't know if they'll get it or not, and I'd be south of San, San Antonio. Um, advantages to semi-confinement, and I'll get to this now. It, it reduced cow unit carrying capacity cost. I think in Nebraska you could run two cows per acre on a pretty good farm. I, I can do it with a pencil. I don't know if you could do it in reality, but you figure it out and you could take two cows and maintain them, rein a calf, and maybe take the calf up to uh, 750 pounds or something like that. So even at $10,000 an acre land, that's $5,000 per cow unit capacity. Well, in the West especially, the land costs have just gotten berserk. Uh, there's lots of ranches that are selling in the West for forty to fifty thousand dollars per cow unit carrying capacity. Well, do the math on that, and even with at three percent interest, that is unless you believe in long-term land appreciation from those levels, that's uh, tremendously high. Uh, reduce cow energy requirements. And you, you cannot believe how much you reduce them. I can tell you this, we've had cows, it depends on the stage of gestation and that, but we've maintained cows on 13 pounds of dry matter per head per day, and they're, and they're, they're content. And uh, now that's a mixed ration and, and reasonably well balanced. And, uh, uh, but just re reducing the movement reduces your maintenance requirements so much. If you reduce the intake, you reduce the gut size, you reduce the liver, and that, and these are very, very metabolically active tissues. And if you reduce that, you'll reduce your maintenance requirement. You'll change the look of your cows. We said uh, uh, two, no. Ed, I'm trying to think of the people from Wyoming that sent the cows to you about, maybe this was seven or eight years ago, and they dropped out and they wanted us to, uh, to maintain them in the dry lot in, uh, up by, uh, in Antelope County. And um, anyway, I, uh, I can remember uh, when I was there, when the guy came back out to look at his cows, he and his foreman, uh, several months later, and, and the cows were in plenty good shape, and as far as I'm, uh, I'm concerned. But they didn't have that huge barrel like a range cow will have, you know, if they're on, especially if they're on fairly poor forage and that. And I can remember the, the ranch foreman says, well, you just ruined these cows. I said, these cows will never be the same. And I said, well, why do you think that? And he said, well, he said, they don't have any gut. He said, they don't have any room in their nap. And he said, they'll never be able to eat feed again. And, you know, it made him happy to see him have a big gut and whatever, but it doesn't add anything to the cow. And, and you sure as hell don't fool the packer buyer at the sale barn, because he can calculate that fill in, in a heartbeat. And so he's not going to pay you for it, but it's going to cost you it's going to cost you to, uh, to maintain the cow. The most fascinating thing to me is the weaning of the calf and the preconditioning just becomes such a piece of cake. We feed, we always feed our cows where we hope the calves can get in and get the feed too, and if we need to, we'll, we'll have a deal set up for where we can creep feed the calves too. And when it comes weaning time, and we wean any time from 120 days to probably 220, depending on a lot of things. Uh, but 
the calf never misses a beat and never misses the cow. Now the cow misses the calf, but you know, it's like the calf says, you shut up mom, I'm, I'm eating, I'm, leave me alone. And people talk about their, all their health troubles they have with calf programs anymore. And I, I grant you they do. But you will have less health trouble with a confined or semi-confined type of cow than you ever will uh, on, a, on a conventional system. The other thing that is, uh, is good is that it's so easy to apply whatever technology you might want to apply, whether it be implanting or vaccines or, or what, what it might be. You've got them right there and you've got them captured. Uh, disadvantage is obviously if, if land accumulation is part of your goal, you're not going to accumulate much land. And I sort of think the party's over on that in most parts of the country, but I could be wrong. But uh, uh, obviously with the land appreciation we've had, a conventional cow operation has been a, has been a great thing. Uh, but I, I don't think these, I, I wouldn't bet that these land prices will keep going up like they have. Uh, if, if you are buying and trying to take advantage of a drought and that and accumulate your cows then, two or three points. Cow, I say cow trading in a drought, it's a lot better to buy than it is to sell because the market will be depressed most likely in that particular area. The cows will be in poor condition so you're buying less weight. Uh, 1,100 pound cow might only weigh 850 pounds if it's a severe drought. Uh, and I think, and uh, there's some smarter people than me in here that I don't know if they've given this any thought, but instinctively I think if you buy a poor conditioned cow because of the drought and she's either heavy bred or has a calf by her side, then she's probably a low maintenance cow or she wouldn't have gotten bred or she wouldn't have had a calf. Now I, I can't prove that but that's what my bias is and it's a little bit like the Supreme Court Justice say and they ask him to define pornography and he said well I can't define it but he said I know it when I see it. And I think I know a low maintenance cow when I see one but I can't really quite describe it. Uh, disadvantages are some. There's obviously a, sh there's a shortage of grass, or else there wouldn't have been a or there wouldn't have, if there's a drought, there's a shortage of grass. Leave it that way. Uh, you could be buying somebody else's problems. You know, the first cows they get rid of in a drought or anything else are going to be the ones that they they can't keep in, or they've got a bad temperament, or or who who knows. So you're you're likely to buy somebody else's problems. The third, if you're the new kid in the block buying these cows. You, maybe you're not necessarily the most popular person, uh, and then, well, let's just face it, in some areas of the country there's a lot, lots of thievery that goes on. And there's, lots of, there's lots of people out there stealing cattle and cows and calves and everything else. And, uh, and they'd rather, I can guarantee you, they'd rather steal, steal a cow in Oklahoma from a guy that was from Texas or California than they would their neighbor's cow. So you might just, you have to just keep, think about those things. Uh, when would the cow herd expand? I don't, I think 2014, but I, I, I wouldn't necessarily bet, about, bet on it. Uh, where will it expand? This is my theory. And it's because I've been someplace, I, I love the Southwest, but as a result, I've been in a drought somewhere all my life, at some t at some time, at some place, I've always been in a drought. And I'm, my fear is that the feed follows the water, and the cattle follow the feed. So figure from there. Obviously, Nebraska and Iowa and South Dakota are going to benefit. Places like I think places I think the Southeast will come back in the cow numbers, and that's some. I'm I'm not sure what the long range weather thing is in the. Uh, 
New Mexico, Arizona, Southern California, West Texas deal because I, I think historically maybe what we think is our bad years or our average years in reality and what we thought were average years were in reality incredibly good years. How would I know? I don't know, but they can, they're finding petroglyphs now in, in caves on the Pecos River that go back about 4,000 years and civilizations that have disappeared, just like the whole Khams and, and the others. And, and uh, they probably disappeared at least partially because of drought. Uh, people tend to talk about expansion forecasts and that based on weather and they, everybody says, oh, it's a drought. Well, we haven't been in a drought for 10 straight years and we kept going down in numbers, so it is more in drought. Their expenses have increased, but they have in a lot of things, and I don't think it's that simple. Uh, we're all getting older. I'm a, I'm a prime example of that, and uh, uh, and I think we have an aging ranching population. But I think we are very unrealistic in blaming something else that will just really tick off probably people in, in various uh, organizations. But go to the second paragraph there. We don't like to discuss the fact that cowmen may not be the smartest people in the room, but they didn't just fall off a turnip truck. And we see what's happening to the fat cattle market and how its fat cattle deal is consolidated and how difficult it is to market cattle now and how two or three or four groups basically manipulate, I won't say manipulate, they control the whole deal. And I think there's a bunch of ranchers out there, I guarantee you I am, I don't want that to ever happen in the cow industry. And I have an exit strategy that the minute I, the minute one of those people comes to me and tells me this is how we're going to buy these calves, I, I know what I'm going to do, and and uh, it's going to be a way to get along without them. And and I think we we have very limited cow expansion because we have a bunch of people that have no faith in the structure of this industry and which direction it's going. And they don't want to see the 10-year cattle cycle come back, and they don't want two or three people dictating what they're going to be paid for their calves. Uh, the fact that we've had declining numbers for the millennium, the 13 years, and what has actually been a very profitable segment of our industry, maybe the only consistently profitable one, sends a very powerful message. And it's, the message definitely is people don't have a lot of faith in the structure of this industry. Now, Joe, if you print all that, roll dial here, the beef man, by the way, it's their 50th uh, year anniversary. If you print, print all that, you're obviously going to piss some people off at me. But, but that's all right, because I'm, I'm going to be in Mississippi, and they, would, they won't bother me down there. But I, I, th I think we overlook it. Uh, final thoughts. Times are changing. They always will. Second, you need an exit strategy in this business. I don't care what, who, who would get in any business and not have an exit strategy. I'm, I'm a Kinky Friedman, Willie Nelson kind of a guy. If your horse stumbles a lot or dies, dismount. Get off and go somewhere else. And the, I, I hear the statement from my feedlot friends and that sometimes. I say, we're going to make the money back where we lost it. Well, now, I just don't understand that game plan. I mean, why would you go back where you lost your money and think next time around is going to be any different? 
be skeptical, and I'm, I'm talking about my opinion. Probably, you probably, everything Terry Kloppenstein tells you, you can probably take to the bank, but be skeptical what some of the rest of us tell you at these talks. And I was on the dog and pony show circuit a lot in the 70s and early 80s. And I just was thinking about some things the other day that I, I heard uh, at a lot of these talks or these meetings, they would have somebody talk on climate and global cooling was the big topic. And there were several people said that there would, in a few years, there would be no corn growing north of Ohio, that the cooling was setting in so fast. Well, that sure changed, didn't it? World population was a big deal and population control. And the theory was we were gonna creep up to six billion people and level off and start back down. Well, we just blew through seven and probably on our way to 10 by 2050. So that's obviously wrong. I'm not gonna name any names there because we've all said things that have proven untrue. But I, two people that you, if you have any memory at all or were around, that you would know and identify with in the, in the feedlot business and that. I was on programs with them when they said, when the grain prices spiked up in two, 1975, I think it was, we're probably after another year or so, we're never gonna feed grain again. Well, that didn't work out there, did it either. And I, I, well, you can go on and on. I could think of a lot of other things, and I said some of them, so, so I'm not uh, passing the blame. Thank you. I have one other thing. I'm, I'm a poet of sorts, and uh, not anymore. Uh, Caroline was my muse, and uh, I, uh, I just, uh, since she died, I don't write much anymore. Anyway, but I wrote this about four or five years ago, and it, it was the good times don't last forever. And, and I think for the cow business, I'll go back to what I said, I think the last 10 years have been the combination of cattle prices, calf, I'm sorry, and packer cow prices, and land prices has been the best 10 years in a row we've ever had. And anyway, the harvest was good and the feed price is low, the pastures were green and the creeks all flow. Health's no problem because the pens are dry. And performance is great and the cattle are high. The bank is relaxed and he sits there smiling and I feel kind of nervous because there's no reason for lying. He grins and he asks, can I lend you more money? I should feel happy, but I feel sort of funny. There's something missing. It's a mysterious void. I called my cycle and I'm reading on Freud. I'll write Anne Ann and Abby when I get back, and if that doesn't work, I'll call Baxter Black. I asked my bartender, who was experienced and loyal, and we had several sessions, along with Crown Royal. And he said, like, you're like a cow that's been given too much hot feed. You've had too much good news, and now you've OD'd. You're accustomed to bad news. And it may sound strange, but the business you're in, the good news will change. And I drove back to the ranch and met the wife at the gate, and she said, we got problems, and you're seven days late. The truck is stuck in the furthest field. The banker's mad because the, the buyer's mad because the cattle didn't yield. The banker called, and they hired a new staff, and they took your values and cut them in half. Our foreman's in the hospital, got thrown over his horse. The cook went home and filed for divorce. The vet looked at our sick calves and the advice he gave, it's too late to worry because there's not many to save. She said, let's go to bed, you've done enough harm. The furnace isn't working and you can keep me warm. And then she whispered into my ear about some IRS letter and it must be the bad news. I'm starting to feel better. So, thank you all.